Hi, good morning. Welcome, everybody. My name is Nancy Burns. I am the Stoddard Associate Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Worcester Art Museum. And today, I'm thrilled to have with me Josefina Hakim, who is one of the feature artists in our current ex exhibition, Us, Them, We, Race, Ethnicity, Identity. And we have a unique opportunity to talk to her about her work and the work that's in our current exhibition, the, Con the California Lottery. Um, this presentation is part of WAM's Giveathon today, and if you enjoy this unique opportunity to hear from Josefina and enjoy all the work that WAM does, I hope you will make a gift this evening by midnight. Uh, hi, Josefina. It's a thrill having you here today. It's always amazing when we have the artists actually come here to the museum because it's a unique opportunity to learn more about your practice and then the works that are in our collection. Um, I thought that maybe for those who may not know your work, that you could tell us a little bit more about your background. Um, you're originally from Colombia. How did you develop an interest in art? And then how did you get from there to here? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nancy, for having me. Uh, I am from Colombia, uh, from the Caribbean, born in Santa Marta, and I was raised in Cartagena, which is a very historically interesting city. And I, ha I have always been interested in art. Since I was little, I was the kid that was drawing in the back of the notebook. And from that um, to the School of Bellas Artes, Fine Arts in Cartagena. And then I came to Florida, and I, I studied also there at University of Florida, but not really until I I did my second migration in 88 that I came to California. That's where I took art seriously, and I finished my master's uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute. And while I was uh, doing my master's is that I created this piece called the California Lottery. Um, I'm really interested in the fact that you have chosen printmaking as one of the primary media that you work in, and I'm you know, as someone who loves prints myself, <laughs> interested in how you developed an interest in the process and why you found it compelling, and also why silk screen, screen printing is something that you're drawn to. Um, that's an excellent question. I loved prints because you could do multiples, because uh, the difference with one work, like a painting or an installation, but painting and drawings, it's one of a kind, whereas when you do all that work, I thought, if you do all that work, you want more people to be able to get it, and, and that's why the, the multiple attracted me. Uh, and another medium that I really like is the linoleum cut, because of, you know, that is so dramatic, especially black and white prints, but uh, I love steel screening because it's very versatile, you can use text, you can use photography, photographies and include them. You can make a photocopy of something and make it part of, the, of, of, of your image. So that's what I like and I, of course I love the colors and, and it's much easier to build the image with, to me, with colors, with silk screen. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I guess that we should take an opportunity to actually talk about this work that recently entered our collection, California Lottery. Um, this work was a activist commission in response to a state initiative called Prop 187 in California. Yes. Um, one, could you tell us a little bit about Prop 187 and then also how this came into being? Um, actually, it was, I think that it was 125th anniversary of the San Francisco Art Institute, and they gave us the opportunity to do public art uh, into a public space on Market Street. You know, they have this kiosk where they put ads. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, you can, the students can show for three weeks uh, a piece of art, but it has to be these dimensions, you know, like six feet by three. Usually they are like, like you know, commercials of Calvert Klein and stuff like that. The easier thing to do, the easier uh, media to do something like that is silk screen, because I had access to this press that 
it was it's, it's, it has it looks like a like a sailboat you know it has like <laughs> a thing that you have to push but you need people so I had to I had to bribe some people with pizza and and beer at the end of each session because I couldn't do it on on, on my own imagine if this is the size the silk screen was the size of that frame so you have to put the, the inks and you have to like, uh, I, I couldn't, so I, yes, I bribe people to help me <laughs> print this at the Mission Cultural Center, which was not the studio of the San Francisco Art Institute, but I had a relationship with them. And this place is the Mission Cultural for Latino Arts. So this is all people from Central America and artists, who were being affected for Proposition 187. So they wanted to, to catch people to, to, to know about the, the struggle. Uh, because one of the things was, as, thank God it didn't pass, but it was like asking teachers to say which students were illegal. And it, so people had, the community had a, a, a real, uh, um, fear of, of this proposition. So I took the opportunity that the San Francisco Art Institute gave me to put my work out there to, uh, to do like a like call attention about this issue because galleries and museums don't, you know, not everybody comes, but the street, the street is public space and people are gonna see this piece and that's what I want people to think. And I also appropriated uh, the Mexican lottery, which is very colorful, and it has la mano, the hand, el corazón, and uh, I took the characters, but I translated it into what's migration for a lot of people, people that don't have uh, an education. They are gonna come to do works of minimum wage and works like taking care of babies, el rufero, construction, and this is all related to that kind of migration. So that's why I took it, because if I did it like you, that doesn't work. <laughs> I think that sometimes making a little bit of humor when things are so dire, call attention on a cause. Not that I'm making fun or anything, but it, it calls you in another way when you go, Oh, it's not a Spanish, Spanglish. Because this we're talking about two cultures, dominant culture, dominant language versus Spanish, which it isn't. And, and what happens with, when two cultures get together? Some of the words come because there are no words for that in Spanish. And there are some because it's easier on the tongue. Uh, so, so like, of course, you can say la camioneta, but troca is sort of easier and also el mope, we have el trapero. And also it brings, I, I love uh, languages and I'm a little bit of a linguistic, I teach Spanish. And so I'm attracted also to the Spanish and to the English and how this, and how language is fluid and changes. So, so that converges also in, in this piece. Um, and since we're talking about it, I can, I can tell you why to include my green card. Uh, one of the professors, um, Claudia Bernardi, she's from Argentina, she says, yes, but you are not part of that kind of migration. You're not, you, were, you have never been illegal. You're, you're educated. Your English is, is, is perfect. <laughs> well, it's not perfect. <laughs> but uh, so she said, what's your, uh, you're appropriating these people's cause. And how are you, how, you know, how are you related to this cause? Because that's not your fight. And I say, yes, it is my fight because often people assume things about me if I don't speak. People assume things about me. I don't say anything. I don't have all my diplomas hanging. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's why it's also my cause and also because I'm an immigrant too. And the green card is like, if, you're, you know, if you don't have papers, the green card is your dream. So that's why, I, that's how I came to that, uh, to, to that's me in this, in this print. And this is a picture of my son, Sebastian. 
And I think that the aesthetics of portraiture, like um, the American has a different aesthetic, oh. like, and like those portraits of Sears with that gray <laughs> little thing and the baby. It's very, in Colombia it's different, it's more like I have pictures black and white or, or in color, but it's more, of, it's a different kind of thing. So I thought that it was like, oh, my American baby with it's me, my life here, and I have Sears portraits of my kids. <laughs> so all that plays into how I, I, am I inserted, because I'm sure they also have children and they also have portraits from Sears. I don't know if they exist anymore, Sears, but... <laughs> I had my portraits on at Sears. <laughs> I totally know what so you're talking it's about. So it's part of your passage as, yeah. as being here, being an American too, and have your kids have Sears portraits. <laughs> I did want to jump back on, you had mentioned um, teaching and uh, how the Prop 187 was going to impact kids in the classroom, yes. and then also that you had taught Spanish. In a previous conversation we had before today, you had mentioned that Spanglish drove you crazy yes. early on. Yes. And so that's one of the things I always found very interesting is that, and part of the reason that this is in the text section, that this um, appropriation of a hybridized language was something that you had fought against as a yes. teacher for a long time and have since come to see as something else. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how that shift happened and also how your teaching has in fact impacted your work as an artist. Um, yes, at the beginning when I first came here, I, I tried like I was a purist and I'd be like, how they can talk like that? That's not, you know, if you're educated, you should keep the Spanish you, and, and I will, all these words were written or I heard them and like uh, there was a bakery called Lelenitas Bakeries and they were saying in Spanish, hacemos todo tipo de queques and I was like, no, 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 no queque, it's torta. <laughs> torta de cumpleaños. And, but now I see, I started changing because if I, I knew that if somebody, for instance, was gonna clean my house and they say that they were gonna vacuumear la carpeta, I was saying, no, 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 no. It's aspirar la alfombra. And I'm like, no, vacuumear la carpeta como quieras. <laughs> uh, I think that in the end, language is about communication. And it's like if somebody pronounced your, your last name right or your name right, you warm up. And if and I stop, I surrender. <laughs> Although when I'm teaching, I'm teaching proper Spanish. <laughs> but if somebody says something in, in Spanglish, I will like maybe, oh, a new word. <laughs> so there is, there is not even, only like a quarter, it's a quarter, but now it's la cuorita, a little quarter. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm totally, um, for changes, as a matter of fact, now uh, more and more people are with gender uh, and um, pronouns. A lot of people want to use a, a gender neutral, which Spanish is all about uh, feminine and masculine, which makes it really hard for English speakers because in English doesn't exist. Now we're talking about a yes and then one gender. And I'm like, hmm, maybe it's not a bad idea. Maybe we'll make it easier for people to learn if we only have one gender and it's more inclusive. And if something is for inclusivity, why not? I mean, I think that a lot of, particularly this tax section, is about how language shifts. And I think that your work is a particularly good example about how um, a group of people, a subculture, create their own language and create a culture as a result yes. of the language that they're creating. Um, I do want to get back to printing this. <laughs> <laughs> I, out of curiosity, and I don't know, is that why you have an edition of 17, because, which is a super odd number for an edition, because just getting to 20 was going to be impossible? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I, originally I thought that I was going to be able to do 25, but 17 was like pushing it. And they, they are edition varie because they are all different because I tried to do, I did this uh, mix of colors. So the more you mix it, 
then the, some have the green up to here and the red. Um, so each one is different and it has to be an edition by It cannot be two of it, nah, it's edition by year. All right, well, I mean, I was curious about that. It's such an interesting number, but I, I assumed it had something to do with just how yeah. challenging. For those of you who are not uh, well-versed on prints, this is insanely large <laughs> screen print to be making, so um, I knew it must have been a Herculean challenge. Um, you've just gone through the exhibition. You've only had a few minutes, but you told me that two works that of particular interest to you or significance are Kara Walker's Cena McPherson's death and also the Lorna Simpson counting. I'm interested in knowing why those two works in particular are particularly compelling to you. Uh, yes, Lorna Simpson counting is one of the works that when I was doing my master's at the San Francisco Art Institute, we were studying about uh, theory of, of race and, and gender. We're talking 97, 96, and this work was very new. Um, an Af African-American woman talking uh, about, not just talking about her hair, but making her hair the subject of formal, uh, formal photography was very, very new. And, and it, it made me realize also I'm from Cartagena, and Cartagena was um, a slave uh, port. So understanding of race also became, uh, was part of that learning because we were learning about it and talking about it and, and doing theory about it and, and making like history bridge. And with the word also of Cara, uh, uh, the McPherson, uh, McPherson death, it's also slavery. And they, they both play for me and as, as like a connection with Cartagena um, uh, the work of the slavery and in prints is very striking to see it because one thing is you see it in a magazine or you see it in a book. And when you see this overblown postcard of something so dark, it's, it, it really like, it, I have goosebumps to see that. And to see it, uh, then you see that little guy with the foot that, that those are the things that is very hard to see when you, when you read a book or a magazine, but to see it there, and it was just uh, in the personal uh, ground to have my work next to that. It's like really, uh, I felt very accomplished. And in the other, it's, it's just, it brings back all those readings and making connections in between people and Cartagena and here and yesterday when I went to Brown University and I saw that sculpture in which they, they talk about, about how they, they recognize in the past uh, the contribution of, of African Americans brought here to work and to build everything. So I've been like, oh my God, <laughs> all this stuff, all this, and then to see that in art, to see that in Brown, to see it here, I just feel like my, my brain is like exploding. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, it's an honor for me to get to meet you in person. Um, I'm thrilled that you came to see the show from California. I think to have acquired this work, it's so compelling and it has really um, had major impact on viewers who have come to see the exhibition. To all of you who have joined us, thank you so much. Uh, please consider making a gift today before midnight at the link that accompanies this video. Um, that your donations support exhibitions like Us Them We and allow us to do lots of other programs like Flora. So thank you again and have a great day. <laughs>